We are recording. All right. Sup, James? How's it going? Hi, not bad. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from sunny Scotland. Sorry, I say sunny Scotland, incredibly wintry Scotland, but you know. Yeah, okay. like, so those two <laughs> words go in the same uh, sentence. <laughs> It's funny, I was having a chat with Jane Bozart last week and she was saying how odd it was that when she came to visit us in Scotland that she actually spent time on a Scottish beach. So um, a lot of her American friends are completely and utterly bemused by the fact that we have beaches in Scotland. So, oh, yeah. wow. On an island? Who would have thought? No. I know. <laughs> cool. All right. I know some of your names. Stacey, Patricia, Reen. thank you for the love that you give us across the different platforms. Appreciate it. I'm going to kick in and get started um it is interactive so i'm gonna open up the chat you guys make friends because it's like-minded people here do what you want to do i'll keep an eye on it but basically today some of you have sent questions which i'll answer to start us off i'll let you know what they are but otherwise put your questions in the chat or you might want to jump in live and um, the questions that are coming up are what is human-centered design how do you say it in a nutshell to people without jargon, uh, difference or similarities between UX and instructional design? How, what else have we got? Oh, when someone gives you like, we need you to do this. And you're like, how do we know that's gonna solve the problem? So how do you handle that? And then a few more specific things, some that are like completely not on topic. So if you wanna know any career advice, freelance stuff, just go to our YouTube. This is a different time and place. So. As I've been saying that there, go and put questions in the chat and as they come up. Also, this is one person's perspective and probably like the Bell Vista Studios perspective. So you guys have experience too. So share that jargon, not jargon, sorry. That's just in my head because someone had that as their question language. But <laughs> share your perspective and insights. It is purely driven by you. That's what human-centered design is about, right? So this Q&A is your, uh, the humans, it's centered around you. I've designed this space for you to get your needs met. Okay, so what is human-centered design? In a nutshell, really quickly, just putting the end user at the heart of the solution, just considering them. Um, if that is your question, Google it, I would say. If um, you don't know really already, like there's, that's your world out there, go Google it. But basically it's about thinking about others and showing empathy towards them. But I will just quickly move into the next question, which is from Anyetta. And if you're keen, Anyetta, you should come in and do this role play with me. So <laughs> Anyetta's question was, you made me think, hey, I had to get up early to like, I was sweating over this. So you said, how would you explain human-centered design to your business stakeholder in a nutshell without using L&D jargon? So I think this will actually answer what is human-centered design, or I'm hoping to. So, Anyetta, you get to be your stakeholder. You can, uh, <laughs> that you're having these conversations with. Um, you, I want you to experience it because then you'll experience how the conversation may go for them. Because nice. you know we're all about empathy when we're doing human-centered design. So I think it's important for that to happen. So thank you for being a willing participant, even though you didn't know that was coming. <laughs> All right, so if people aren't getting things, I always think that they need to experience it, right? And we know this as instructional designers. So I want you to kind of reflect. So I don't know, we're having a meeting, I guess, Anietta? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. So Anietta is my stakeholder. She wants to do human-centered design for her project, I'm assuming, with activities. And they're just like, we don't get it. We don't have time. Let's deliver the project. Yeah. Right. Cool. All right. So keen, keen, to know, keen to know your approach, Kim. So, and your, your approach, you're telling me it's going to be human centered design. So, you've told me that you need to have some of my SMEs involvement because of that. I might be, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm going with that one. So, cool. Okay. So, have you, Anyeta, ever been in a conversation where someone gives you advice that's not right for you or not relevant? Hmm. Yes, I ha probably have, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> um, well, why do you think they do that? Probably because I don't know exactly what it's like to be in, in the shoes of that person. Yes, you're correct, Kim. <laughs> hmm. yeah, they might 
Yeah, go I've on. I've taken it too quickly, haven't I? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not really listening to you and they're kind of putting their view of the world onto your view of the world as well. But, but what if I know, but what if I know that their job as well as they do? Mm, how do you know that to be the case? Because I'm, I'm, um, that's my job. It's in my, it's in my job description to know their role. I, I'm not playing hard person here. If I'm their team manager or their senior, I'm supposed to know their role better than they are sometimes, most times. Who told you and that? They, sorry? Who told you that? They, they will tell us that. As in your SME or are you role playing right now? I'm, I'm, I'm role playing. So okay, I'm, cool. I'm role playing. So. Oh, so your staff member think that you got to be the expert, hey? You got to be mm. better than them. That's a lot of pressure. Mm. Mm, I know, but that's, that's our job. Okay. And, well, and our people on the floor, we don't, they don't have time to come in to do what you want them to do. So I'm it. Sounds like it's not important then. We shouldn't worry about it. Oh no, it is important because we need them to do their job really well. They're, they're most important. They're most, we, we, we believe they're most important to us. Like we care about our people. <laughs> so what tells you then that they're not doing their job now to the best of what you want them to be performing at? What evidence do you have? Oh, Grace, help me here. <laughs> <laughs> Grace um, is closer to it than I am. No, that's fine. Um, evidence would be the KPI targets. So they're not meeting the targets for um, their role. Um, the other thing would be possibly, um, I guess the metrics, um, you know, money, um, they'll be reporting on a financial and end of the financial year that we're losing money. And when they do the whole analysis, it comes down to the fact that, uh, whilst a little bit might be contributed by uh, market shares, there's a, probably a huge proportion that's driven by, um, internal functions. And it's not just environmental, um, it could mm. be knowledge and skill, uh, behavior observation oh, yeah. motivation yeah 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 so how specifically do you know that things like motivation skills and knowledge are not helping you meet those financial objectives and people aren't meeting their kpis what specific tangible things can you see that show you that those staff members aren't doing that oh wow all of what the spot <laughs> um what specific things um so it would be um probably not returning phone calls in a timely manner the attitude they have with customers so when you're on the phone and you're hearing them get on the phone speaking to a client um it's the tone they have with the client it's the um I wouldn't say lack of empathy because that's a personal or a subjective observation I'm referring to just um, objective things here. So it would be, um, you know, complaints they receive from the clients saying, you know, um, Gracie did not respond to my call. And when she did, she had this attitude. And not only that, you know, she seemed to have, you know, like she wasn't paying attention. So you, the, we, not, we, we normally get to um, reach out to our clients to see how best we're w working with them um, from a um, client experience. And that feedback we receive from them is what might fit into mm, yeah. that. It's interesting that you use the word subjective to describe what you were describing there, because, um, you know, the things like timely manner and the tone, I would say they're subjective. So I wonder if there's a disconnect between what is that benchmark of performance so people know what timely manner looks like and the appropriate tone is. Like, is that communicated? Is that, how do we know people know that the timely manner is, I don't know, two hours? Uh -huh. Or, you know, is this very clearly articulated? Because I, what I find in my experience in the world is that humans are innately good humans and they want to do the best to their ability with the best of the knowledge and access and information that they have available to them. So what I kind of think is, you know, maybe we're letting them down. Maybe mm -hmm. that these good humans out there, because when we think about performance issues in an organization and bad, disgruntled, disengaged employees is a small percentage, right? So if we were to focus on like these performance gaps and these KPIs being missed, it sounds like, you know, 
maybe we're not supporting them to the best of our ability as an organization. And we need to dig deeper to understand the true problem so that we can get the results that you're trying to achieve. How does that yeah. sound to you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, no, no, definitely. Cool. So to do that, what I want to do is we're going to do the initiative, but I'm going to run a couple of activities that are appropriate that I think will really help us solve the right problem, which you guys have just acknowledged is important to do. And it's going to get the results that you're saying. So do you support me to run those activities? I'll pull you in those SMEs when I need them. Um, but I'm going to minimize effort. I don't want, I know you got conflicting priorities. We're all busy minimal time. So I'm only get you there when I need you there. And just trust me on this. How does that sound? Locked in, sweating, but I think we got there. <laughs> I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Because that was your thing. Problem solved. Okay. I think there was, I had another bit of a script actually, but you took it down another way. And if we go back to the initial thing of helping people empathize with trying to explain human-centered design to people that don't know the jargon or don't get it, is you know trying to put uh, examples and stories which we know from learning um, up into them for them to experience it. So I guess another one that I had was asking them, has anyone ever wasted your time? And so the example, you ever been to a meeting that could have been an email or a phone call, and everyone's like, oh yeah, well you know. Do you think like, why did that happen? So you ask them, oh, they didn't like think about it properly. They just automatically reacted. All this kind of stuff comes out. You go, yeah, it sounds like they didn't think about the true problem that they're trying to solve, right? So then you, what we want them to have the emotional reaction to what we're saying. So in that instance, I go, how do you feel when like you're sitting there frustrated in a meeting where you could be doing something better? Or how do you feel when someone gives you advice in a conversation and you're like, this is not relevant to me. You're not getting my situation right now. Shut up. Like, so, and then they'll go, oh, I feel frustrated, annoyed and things like that. And then basically it's like, okay, well, do we want, do you actually, we need to use the language you, right? For that accountability. Do you want people to have that reaction to our project that we're working on? Definitely not. Cool. So what we're going to do, and this is how it ended the last, your role play is I'm going to run some activities. You won't even know they're happening, but there'll be an element of that kind of happening. I'm going to run some activities. We're going to get this sorted, the solution, the results that you want, but I'm going to do it in a way that you're just trust me on my process, but it's going to get us the results. Satisfied? Cool. Hope that was useful. Keep putting your uh, questions in the chat. I'm gonna go on to the next question, which is, I'm often in scenarios where clients have, actually just before I move on, I encourage you in the chat to reflect on any kind of things that I said, things that you heard, that I, is your reflective practice of things that you should be putting into your own toolkit for dealing with stakeholders in future. So next question was, I'm often in scenarios where clients have already made a decision to build a rides force. Dun, dun, dun. This happens quite frequently. Um, or just the string of videos. So basically, solution is being pushed at us. So how do you implement design thinking or human-centered design in cookie cutter courses? Well, that's where I started my career, actually. Just those boring next button e-learning things. Yes, I am guilty of it. I knew no better. Um, but then when I started learning myself, I was learning about human-centered design and other things like action mapping. And then I just started having conversations. So there's two avenues. There's one where, yes, they come at you and they say, oh, we just need you to build an e-learning course. And then you go, okay, well, how do we know we're trying to solve the right problem, you know, and go down that avenue. And you can influence through conversation. But if we think about specific human-centered design activities, what can we do when that comes in? So someone goes, we need a 20 minute e-learning course, has to be built in Storyline or we need a three minute video and it's yeah gonna be uploaded onto our internet. So there's still opportunity to run activities, okay? So one activity you can run is empathy maps. Empathy maps are amazing, my number one favorite tool and they help me the most. We have a video on YouTube that shows you how to do it, but basically it's focusing on actions and behaviors, right? So what would we see here people think or do if they were doing that thing correctly? 
So when we do an empathy map, we're able to extract information. Where does that information go? Well, actually, like that helps you write the video script, right? That helps you look at the content that goes within the RISE course when someone hasn't just gone, convert this PowerPoint to RISE. So that's one way. Um, with user interviews, so that's where we go to our learners, okay? And we say, um, you know, like, why do you think this problem exists? Why do you think we need training on this? So when you speak to people in the organization, the employees, the people that the training is targeted at, well, we get really good language to use that helps us storyboard. So we get to hear things about what they care about. And then how we use that language is through motivation. So when we go back with the training, we can start with why. Why should you care about this training? And we use the language that the employees have given us to go, oh, I should pay attention to this training that's coming up. So that's just a minor way of using user interviews. Um, prototyping is a part of human-centered design. So it's like you produce a rough something and product, you put it out into the world, you get feedback, you come back, you make improvements based on that. It's just a feedback process, right? So you can do that for your look and feel, you do it for SME feedback and things like that, uh, job aids, whatever you're designing, you put out a rough, maybe sometimes it depends. It could be a 20% finished product or it could be 80% finished product, but you put it out, you get feedback and you come back. You don't, it's not about having a 100% finished product until you've gone out and tested that it's actually solving the problem. And then, yeah, sorry, can I ask? Yeah. Is there a difference between a prototype and a storyboard? Um, so my view of a prototype is an unfinished something. So a storyboard is an example of an unfinished something, right? So a storyboard is a prototype in my opinion, because you write it and then you go for feedback. So it's not a final product, you're asking for input. We know this isn't right yet. We know that we might need to include more content or change content or refine scenarios or something like that. So we're looking for input to improve it. So that's what I would say a prototype is. Some sort of tangible product that we need in, uh, feedback on to improve it to the next level. Thank you. All good. And last one on this question is like brainstorming is a big part of it, right? You don't have all the answers and they talk about in design thinking, you go as wide as possible. Um, you ask questions like, how might we? Um, you do little brainstorming activities. You can just Google what they are, but like what's the most in 30 seconds, how many uses for a spoon can you use? Now go apply that creative thinking to the problem that you're trying to solve. So when you have a cookie cutter, like we need you to do this, it's about like, okay, well, how could I present this information in the most useful way? So what does it look like in the real world if I saw that happen? And can we replicate that? And sometimes it's difficult because like, if you think about the limitations of RISE, you know, we only have certain blocks to work within. So what is the best way that's going to help someone apply it or engage or interact with that so that it's memorable afterwards so there's some activities on how you can do it when you're kind of given this shell to work with all right i'm jumping into the chat it'd be good to hear an example but oh mate james action mapping and human-centered design they are a match made in heaven um, okay, so how does our process work with that? Action mapping. Okay, so we had a, first of all, I learned action mapping, amazing, still use it every single project. Then I learned about human-centered design. It was about in integrating the activity. So we had a um, client come to us and they said, Kim, we need mental health training. It needs to be e-learning, needs to be 20 minutes. Like, okay, cool. Um, so we do action mapping, right? We run an action mapping workshop, which is, that's Kathy Moore's idea. Someone will probably put it in the chat because it's amazing, everyone here should know about it. But basically we go in and we go, okay, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What is the actions and behaviors and decisions that someone needs to know? So if you're familiar with action mapping, that's what you're trying to figure out, right? Then what's beautiful about that is you can do something like an empathy map, okay? So we, I you think about, okay, well, what are, 
what's the action mapping? Sorry, there's like noise distracting me now. So sorry. Um, <laughs> so one of the action mapping questions is what challenges exist that we know that that is a problem in the organization, right? So if I think about my mental health thing, I'm like, well, how do you know that people need mental health training? And they're like, um, well, you know, like, it's just the times, you know, everyone's working from home now, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, you don't really know the true problem there. So we dive deeper into it. And that's where we go and we speak to the workforce. So this is where human centered design comes in. We go interview people and say, with specific questions, um, you know, how are you feeling? What's going on? There's all certain questions that you ask, but you understand what is going on in their world. And then we go, okay, we have a more informed insight into the problem that the workforce is facing, not what the business is thinking, because they just get funding and they're like, oh, we should shove it onto mental health training. So then we have a better informed idea of what the problem is, okay? because the people have told us that. So then we go back to action, action mapping. We say, if these are like the learning objectives or the things that we're trying to achieve, our goals or our behaviors, what actions and decisions do we need to train to help improve those things that the workforce are facing? And then another blend of that is that we use empathy mapping. So that's where it's like, well, what do people in the perfect world, if someone was, in an environment, in a workplace where, you know, there were no mental health issues or people were checking in on other staff members, because that's like what we want people to do is make sure we're like supporting each other. Leaders are having conversations about it. So in the perfect world, if we saw people doing that, what would it look like? If we heard people having conversations, what specific things would they be saying? Um, what would we see people do in the workforce? For example, they would ring up the counseling service and ask for help. They wouldn't be afraid to do that, you know? So that's kind of how it blends out. And then from there, you would do things like, I guess that's the most part because it's around the analysis. And then it goes into human-centered design where basically you're prototyping and brainstorming, which is, I guess, where action mapping stops in my practice of it. Happy, satisfied for now? Thank you very much, Kim. Oh, good. Um, looking at the chat here. Da -da, thanks for putting Stacy that blog for Kathy Moore's action mapping. And da -da -da -da, yeah, psychology actually is like instructional design, UX. That's the next question actually that we had is the similarities between UX and instructional design. So the way I look at it is we're all problem solvers, right? So an organization is saying, we have this problem, we need your help to solve it. Where it happens is an instructional designer traditionally will solve problems where the solution is training or performance focused. User experience designers may solve problems that are product or technology focused. But as the world is opening up, we're now no noticing that it's not siloed skills and roles basically anymore. They're all blending. So psychology, marketing, change management, instructional design, user experience design, they all are problem solving. And essentially what is happening is we all use the same skills and activities to solve a problem. Our outputs are just different. And that's where I think my, uh, appreciation of the role title learning experience designer is coming from is instructional designers have who have learned about human centered design and user experience are starting to bring over those activities such as empathy mapping user interviews user observations and putting that in their toolkit with things like CAF and SAM and ADDI and action mapping and just in taking their skills to the next level and that's where the roles are kind of merging. All right, what else have we got? Du, 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 du. Okay, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Otherwise I'm going back to my list, which is, du, 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 du. don't know if I have any. Yeah, we're all problem solving. Does anyone want to come on and chat and ask a question live or do you want to put it in the chat or you want to dive deeper into this? Cause I don't want to, I'm not a teacher or a trainer. <laughs> 
So unmute yourself, jump in. I can do a role play with you. I'm happy to be sweating even more. Tick tock, tick tock. I'll just give time. Cause that's one important thing actually is the power of silence. So when you're doing activities uh, with, you know, human centered design activities or when you're in meetings or conversations, I think the power of silence is so good because people will verb verbal vomit stuff out, but we give them that time to process stuff. And that's where the deeper, more important information comes from. So I like to create awkward silences so we can spend the rest of the time just in awkward silence. If you want. <laughs> so I, I, have a, I have a question then. So what, what, what do you think are some of the, the problematic areas of using um, human centered design? Because I mean, I, I, so to give you an example, I use action mapping a lot and in every instructional design team I've taken over, I've always um, introduced it because like mm. yourself, I think it's a, a, a fantastically um, effective methodology because it's, it's, it's rooted in common sense and it, and it yeah. makes common sense when you actually use it. But I have seen some people stumble over it when, when they use it. Like, for example, um, they over-engineer the outcomes or they seem to think that every outcome must have a, what the learner must do. So they, they, they just overthink it. So I'm mm. quite curious, if someone was attempting to use human-centered design and, and, getting, and getting their feet wet with it, what do you think are some of the, the things to think about in terms of you know, the, the problematic areas? Um, I think it's a mindset thing, really. And same with action mapping, because at the end of the day, they're both processes. So really, and like Kathy Moore has it like very like spelt out, do this, you know, she's got the workflow going. So what's happening is they're deviating from the process is what I would say. Um, so if I think about the mindset, if you can get to a place of trusting the process, and revisiting continuously the project goal and the question that I always, I tried to embed in my team and now I'm reaping the results of that is the decision that you're making right now instructional designer or the task that you're doing right now how is that helping you achieve the project goal for the success statement so when you say that it sounds really worthy of paying attention to but help me understand how that is pay, that is helping us achieve the project goal and I think that's a really good, simple question to train your team on to help them think about, am I getting distracted now from the process because I like the idea of this shiny solution, or I personally think that this is the critical thing that will solve all business needs, so I'm going to over-engineer it. But there's a, a, like a gauge of how much you need to go in. So the way that you figure out what that gauge is, is am I still meeting the project goal? Am I still meeting the project goal? Am I still meeting the project goal? Not quite anymore. Okay, so where do I readjust back to what's just enough? Great, thank you very much. All good. Next question. I've got one. Yeah. <laughs> Performance objectives versus learning objectives. Um, so action mapping is mm -hmm. you're probably um, talking around more performance objectives because you're to do how to do like your learners, not learners, but your people are, you're working towards something, how they to do something mm -hmm. as opposed to learning something. So I guess what we have um, in our team to and fro, we talk about, are we talking performance objectives or learning objectives when mm -hmm. we design something? Kim, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I think this is where sometimes as an industry, we get caught up on jargon doesn't really matter. Mm. So like you see, I don't even read the blogs, but like you see all the time learning objectives They're what are the point of them? They like stupid, you know, there's blogs about that. And then there's like how to write effective learning objectives. So mm. everyone's got an opinion. But at the end of the day, if we think about the problem we as an industry are trying to solve is to improve performance to achieve some sort of business. So yep. therefore, I think that all training should be focused on performance. performance. And the difference, what I'm hearing for you there is actions and behaviors versus yep. information course. Yep. So, and that's where you got to go is, are we just communicating information now? Does it need to be training? Right. Versus yes. are okay. we trying to change behavior, which is actions and decisions? 
So back to what is the problem? Yeah, like, yeah, cool. Nice. All good. Um, I think that leads on to some other questions. So problem solving, like the first thing is we tend to not solve the right problem and we're not clear on the problem that we're trying to solve. So if that works for you, we can go there because i got two questions that probably will help us experience that, I guess. So two questions that came on were, how can we make instructional design more inclusive for learners with disabilities? And then the next one is taking mental disabilities and mental health of learners into account while learning or teaching online, which in itself actually isn't a question. But is either of those people in here? Because I'd love to get you on and work through this with you. So if you are, just unmute yourself and say, yeah, that was me. And we're actually going oh. to, I'm happy to like role play this with whoever it is. Um, so I asked the question about um, including um, learners with disabilities, uh, but I just want <laughs> to have a disclaimer. I am a recent graduate and I haven't had experience in instructional design. So I just came here wanting to absorb. <laughs> cool. Well, you're going to absorb in a, a 3D version now because you're going to be part of this conversation. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's really interesting. So the first thing is they're both worthy things, right? What we should be considering all learners. Um, but what stunts us, I believe, as instructional designers is that we're not solving the right problem. And I wanted to use these two examples to demonstrate that because they're not clear on what the actual problem is. So the first one is like, it's not framed as a question. So how, do, like we can't, re it's just a statement. So the thing is there that we have to check ourselves is how do we know this to be true? What data exists in the world to help us know that that is a problem, you know, and that's where we get it from, uh, like the HR team or sales KPIs or things like that. But it's not enough to know that. So if I go back to the language of, and I think this is the other person's question, but how can we make instructional design more inclusive for learners with disabilities? So I'm going to ask myself, how do I know that's a problem? Like, how do I know that learners with disabilities are facing problems and what are the problems that they're facing? So it's not specific enough. So sometimes I like to use the word specific to help me frame it and narrow it even more because it makes me think about it on a deeper level. If I break down the question again, so how can we make instructional design more inclusive? Well, I'm not it's that word inclusive and more inclusive. What is the current level of inclusivity and where do we need it to be? So our performance benchmark. So I'm not clear on the problem that we're trying to solve. So can I, I'd like, can I take a moment to step in real quick? Yeah. Thank you. My name's Kira. I'm a former educator. I used to be in a classroom. Um, and so this question of inclusivity kind of sparked something for me yeah. in that it's very similar to how a teacher changes their lessons to, to help their students to have disabilities. And it's very specific to each kid. Each student has what's known as like an IEP or an individualized education plan. So if you are an instructional designer creating uh, learning and you have someone with disabilities, it's gonna be pretty important for you to know what disabilities they have. That way you're able to create a, a, a learning experience that includes them. Uh, whereas I, I can't, off of the bat, create something that's you know great for blind people, for deaf people, for seeing people, and for limited reading capability people. I need to know <laughs> ahead of time uh, what I'm working with before I can create that. So that's my input there. Yeah, I love that. And so what you're demonstrating is you're getting more specific. What's the problem I'm trying to solve? Yeah, and I love that. And that is our role. Like, so we would then expand the question based on Kira's input to be how can it be more inclusive? We still haven't defined that for learners with disabilities. Learners with disabilities now becomes people that are vision impaired, people that cannot use a keyboard. So it's getting more and more granular. And now it becomes a bit more clearer on the problem that we're trying to solve. So I would spend as much time as possible to figure out 
the specifics of the problem that you're trying to solve. Does anyone else want to jump in on how? So actually, one of the Kathy Moore again has that formula for writing business goals. It's something like X will increase or decrease by a certain percentage by a certain time when people do X, Y, Z. So that's one formula. There's other formulas, but that's kind of how you would get to that specific of I'm solving the right problem, yes or no. Does anyone else want to share tips on how to do that? Because that is the critical success to, you know, how we do what we do and what we end up creating. Yeah, I put an example in, in the chat there, but I'll, I'll expand on it slightly. It's one that Julie Dirksen uh, used in her book, Design for How People Learn. And if, if anyone hasn't read that, I would massively encourage you to do so because it, it's an absolute Bible. But um, she was working on a, a drug prevention uh, course for, for teenagers and her stakeholders were trying to push her down the route of the outcome we're trying to reach here is, is that kids understand that, that drugs are bad. But she knew that was quite a rote thing to be uh, to be reaching for. So through asking the right questions and actually having a journalistic, uh, that, that, that kind of dog with a bone mindset of, of, of digging deeper and always asking the questions, she, she worked out the problem they were trying, they were really trying to solve with this peer pressure. Kids were, um, they, they felt that they couldn't say no without looking small in front of their, their fellow teenagers. So everyone knows that drugs are bad, um, but it's how you deal with that peer pressure. That, that, that's what she understood was, was the real problem they were trying to solve there. And, you know, but it, it one, one of the skills I think a, a, a great instructor designer has got is, is that kind of journalistic um you know that, that, that kind of ferocity of always and I, so I guess it's putting your ego aside as well because you might be told a certain answer but if, if you if you think there's more to it you've, you've got to keep going and asking the right questions yes I love that I've never used that term before the journalistic stuff but I think that's so true is we don't need to be experts as instructional designers we're taking people through a process and if we have the mindset of being curious our lives are way easier we don't have to be stressed about what we're doing. If we're talking to a CEO, we're talking to someone else in the business, it doesn't matter. We're there to solve a problem. And if we're curious, it's way easier to do that. Um, I'm actually going to share with you some questions that we asked to help solve the problem the right way, to understand it and dig deeper, to uncover things like Kira was saying that, you know, these learners with disabilities are specifically vision impaired or whatever it is. Um, and then Kira, I'd love actually for you to jump in then and say, this is how I was able to do it in the classroom for each individual student. This is my process. So the questions we would ask is, what is the desired user experience? What is important to the business? What is important to the user? What are the current pain points? And what is the ultimate goal? So we've refined those questions and we find that they help us reveal enough context to then write a successful um, project goal that is focused on performance that then guides the rest of the project. So that's what our process is. Kira, do you have, how do you figure out that individual need or problem? So I'm also an aspiring <laughs> instructional designer, but as a teacher, mm. um, it really does come down to sort of a communication point of, of really knowing what that problem is. And then you can really build it up from there. Yeah. So do you have any specific questions that you've benefited from to when you are communicating with them? What has made it difficult for you to learn in previous classroom settings? Love that. That's really cool. Does anyone else have any good questions to ask to understand the true problem? I guess you could, you could ask, what, what, what did you try and do last week that you wanted to do and you couldn't actually do it? Mm. I like it. Hearing some team stuff going on there, James. <laughs> <laughs> Not my team, obviously, but... You know. <laughs> All teams in the world. <laughs> all right, so we got five minutes left. This is all about you. So what do you want to know? Get what you can from me. Make this add value to your lives. I don't want you going, that was a waste of my time. Kim wasn't human centered at all. <gasps> so I have a question. Um, I train uh, mostly new hires. 
So when we talk about like putting user personas together and I don't already have like, uh, you know, like a place to go and get feedback, um, I tend to go towards more like researching on my own, like through Google, like generational like traits and stuff like that. And I've seen a lot of stuff in the IND community that is like really trying to focus away from those type of personas. So what kind of advice do you have about like building personas when you don't know the person? Hmm. So I'm actually thinking what's the problem you're trying to solve right now? Cause is the problem, the influence of the industry saying, don't do that. And you're like, oh, should I still continue to do personas? Or do you want to know that it's okay to make assumptions about the person you're doing a persona on? Um, I think it's more uh, that um, I want to create human-centered designs for them, but I still want to be able to, you know, be able to touch the points that inspires them to want to continue to learn. Mm. without knowing them and so sometimes I feel like I research like generalization more besides just knowing like the person like say for like millennials they only wanted to learn like micro learning mm -hmm. but like say gen x wants to read an article like yeah just how how they learn more I think yeah well I think you know not always do we have a perfect world where we have access to people but I think you're doing a great thing by just trying to empathize and it's okay to guess and it's okay to assume because it's better than not considering them at all is my opinion. And I think there are a lot of cases where we can put ourselves into their shoes and imagine what it would be like if I was that person, when I was a teenager, when I was in my 20s, when I'm 50, what will I care about? All these sorts of things, like just the fact that we're trying to embody the person that we're designing for will put our solution in a better place. So it's okay to not have a perfect thing because there's over 7 billion people in the world. And just because we're classifying millennials this way and baby boomers this way, doesn't mean that every single one of them is that way, but it's enough of empathy to create something better for them, in my opinion. Great. Great. Like it. <laughs> Just run with it until it doesn't work, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Everything's an experiment. Is, like, I think most of it is like, is there something else I'm supposed to be like, maybe trying to research about people? Maybe. I don't know. Nah, I think we can information overload, right? And then that overwhelms us into inaction. And I'm just like, again, is this helping me achieve my project goal? Yes or no? Get that gauge going. Am I spending eight hours researching this one human being type? Is that helping me achieve the goal? Well, yeah, because this is a multi-million dollar project, so I should really do that. Or like I'm just doing this little five-minute training piece. So if I spend five minutes doing that persona activity, it's enough to help me achieve the project goal. Yeah. What else? Last question. Jump in. I think, Marnelli, you might be talking, but you're on mute. Oh, I was just thinking, I don't have much to say. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, all right. Well, we'll wrap up now. Um, for those of you that are aspiring instructional designers, lose that language. I encourage you, you're just an instructional designer now. Welcome to the crew. We're all aspiring to be better every day. So no one's ever perfect. So just that's a mindset shift, I think. So don't worry about being new or just a graduate. You're an instructional designer. You solve problems. We're all learning. We're all improving. There's still things I have to learn. I make mistakes every day. Um, I would love to know, unmute yourself, was the one action you were gonna put in place as a result of attending and spending 45 minutes with me and your friends here? I'm going to Google empathy mapping, action mapping, Kathy Moore and Julie Dirkskin. Yes, nice. And then you need another action after you've done those Googling and researching. <laughs> <laughs> True. What else? Actions, people? 
I'm just going to, I think just hearing the idea of being, having a curious mind and make, make it being effortless along the line, I quite like that a lot. So just being curious along with when they go for meetings and um, just discussions moving forward. Nice. I like it. Thank you. I'm going to be persistent to, yeah, talk to the, the, the people on the floor. <laughs> nice. Just do it in secret. Yeah, actually. Wear like ninja clothes so no one ninja. knows that you're there. Be oh, stealth. I like it. <laughs> Write that down, ninja. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Uh, I'm going to go off and look at. Sorry. No, go, James. You go first. It's your, thank, thank you. So I'm just going to say, I, I'm going to go look at, uh, obviously I said action mapping as our core process and we use a lot of the, the element, we've fe flexed it a bit to um, take in some of Julie Dirksen's, uh, you know, best practice advice, but, you know, we're going to now look at how to uh, implement human centered design as part of that. And, and, and like, like here at uh, empathy mapping or something, I'm, that's my first action is to look into more of that in more, more detail. Yeah, cool. Jump onto our YouTube. We've got the playlist for human centered designers and Hannah takes you through how to run an empathy map if you haven't seen that one already. Oh, great. Lovely. But that Lovely. honestly, empathy mapping, if I did no other activity, that would help me write a storyboard in a training course. It's that like when you get really good at it, it's the ultimate. I never have to Google or research any anything. And I wouldn't be able to be an instructional designer if that was the way. I just want to extract the information, be curious. People give me the specific scenarios, the specific scripts, and the rest of the course is written. I just massage it. All right, Stacey, what's your action? Um, I think for me, it's going to um, ask more questions. Um, most of the time, you find yourself in the place where you're just the order taker, and they're like, here, this is what I want you to do, and I want you to make a training. So I definitely think that. Um, you know, asking the questions about are we solving the right goals? Are we, you know, would definitely help you design it better. So that's my action. Nice. Marnelli, action. Um, it'd be learning more as well. Um, being familiar with a lot of the buzzwords that were said, even <laughs> something as simple as Addy, because I hear it thrown around a lot. Yeah, nice. Who else? Actions, actions. Um, thank you. Well, your actions now are summarizing the call. So appreciate that. I didn't have to do it. <laughs> um, I, did it add value? Thumbs up. Was it worth your time being here? Yeah, nice one. <clears throat> well, thanks everyone. I'll let you just go about your evenings and your days. Appreciate. Can, can, can I say one thing before yeah. we go, if that's okay? Um, yeah. I just want to say a little public thank you to Kim. I did a, a talk in DevLearn, which is one of the e-learning e guilds uh, conferences. It was done virtually. And Kim very kindly gave her time for free and did a video for, for the session that I did. So uh, this is the first time I've had a chance to, to thank you publicly for that, Kim. So thank you very much. You are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'll hang around for another five minutes, otherwise drop off. But yeah, if you have anything, you are most welcome. Appreciate you choosing to learn with us as well. It's always nice that the stuff that we put out in the world is actually having an impact. And we put it out there because it really has helped us as instructional designers and our clients and our learners. So thanks for choosing to learn with us. Thanks very much, Kim. Nice to meet you all. Cheers. Um, I actually have a question. So um since I'm kind of at crossroads with my career, I was wondering how much a certificate for um, instructional design, or I guess like a master's is compared to um, getting as much experience as I can. Mm -hmm. Depends on who you ask, but <laughs> uh, my opinion and the, like none of my team, we don't have degrees or anything in this, um, the action mapping, you need to learn that. That's going to be the number one thing I think that will help your career because it's very practical. Um, and just every day be curious and learn and then apply what you learn. Because I believe that degrees and certificates and all that, they're outdated by the time we're ready to apply in the world. And things change every day because human beings change every day. Our motivations change every day as a human being and we're dealing with humans. So therefore... If you take, it's a mindset thing. If you take the mindset of being curious, asking questions of the things that you've asked today, you'll already be a better practitioner. Yeah. Sure, just wanted a second opinion on that. Thank you so much for having your talk today. Oh, good. Thanks for joining. Mm -hmm.
Okay, bye bye. 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 Yeah, right, you're um, hanging around. Go on, what you want? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I really want to just thank you for this session. It was really, really helpful. Oh, good. Um, but I'm also just curious because I'm keen to do the human centered design that's coming up. I think it'd be oh, yeah, next, next day. Yeah. Yeah. And um, as I've not I've checked out the schedule, um, but I'm mm. also just curious about the group activity because I really want to be part of that. Yeah. Um, and I need to go feedback to my boss as to how to fit into our role. So can you just talk me a little bit about the flexibility? Like I know about the eight to 10 o'clock slot, which is absolutely fine. Yep. But the group activity, um, how that will work. And if it's still, if I can work it around so that I still manage to finish it by the, I think it's, I believe it's the first week of March. I'm yeah, look, that part of it, you just do in your own time. It's your thing. So the last cohort, we had someone that was doing a two year project. So like, and in eight weeks, we're not going to support them the whole way through. So yeah. your project is happens and we guide you where we can. And that's why you have the individual coaching. So if you have a long project or a short project, you can just call on us when you need it. Um, the most important thing is the group coaching. I think that's where people are benefiting the most is because you get to hear from your peers and you get what you need. So with the project stuff, you just when you can do it and what you can do in regards to that is what yeah. I'd say. Yeah. I'm I'm just hanging because I'm I'm considering whether I do it in January too. That's so you are you both in Australia? We're we're both yeah. from the same team. Oh both in okay. <laughs> so there's well publicly she said it anyway. I don't know if you know Nicole at the ID crowd. No. Okay, well they're really good. Um I'm just gonna stop. Thanks everyone for watching. Appreciate you in the recording. Take action, put your actions in the comment, do all that jazz.